Okay, so in this video, we are going to derive Bernoulli's equation all in one video. So a little while ago, I made a series of, I think, four videos that went into depth as to how to derive Bernoulli's equation for an ideal fluid. But in this video, I just want to do it all in one video in case you just need the derivation very quickly. However, if you do want to go into detail, I would highly suggest those four videos that are linked down below, and I go into detail about how we derive Bernoulli's equation. Also, notes. I'll have notes for this derivation down in the description below if it helps, but without further ado, let's derive Bernoulli's equation all in one video, hopefully. Okay, so for ideal fluids, and remember, ideal fluids are fluids that are one, non-viscous, have laminar flow, and the fluid itself is incompressible. So these are the three assumptions made for ideal fluids or the ideal fluid model. And one of the most important equations was the equation of continuity. And this is a really important equation in fluid dynamics. And that was flow rates along two points are equal to one another. Or in other words, A1, the cross-sectional area times V1 velocity is equal to A2 times V2. So this is one of the most important equations in fluid dynamics. The second is the conservation of energy equation. So you might know this conservation of energy equation to be something along the lines of delta K plus delta U is equal to W EXT. Now delta K is the total change in kinetic energy plus delta U which is the total change in gravitational potential energy and that is equal to the work done by external forces. And in this video, what we can do is we can apply this conservation of energy equation as well as the equation of continuity to derive Bernoulli's equation. Now, delta K, I want to define as 1 half mv2 squared minus 1 half mv1 squared. And this is just the difference in kinetic energy at point 2 and at point 1. And the same thing for delta U, that is the gravitational potential energy, and that is going to be mgy2 minus mgy1. And these y values are our heights, so those are the distances from some datum that we draw some baseline up to those two points. So the difference in these two terms is the total change in potential, gravitational potential energy, delta U. Now there's something very interesting about this equation. Let's say that there were no external forces. If there were no external forces, this work term would be zero. And what that tells us is that the total energy in the system, this delta K plus delta U, remains the same, always going to be equal to zero. In other words, the energy in the system is going to remain constant. It's not gonna be created, it's not gonna be destroyed, it's just gonna transform from one form into the other and vice versa. Okay, so going back to fluid dynamics, let's say we had a very simple flow tube here. And inside of this flow, we had liquid going up the tube or in this direction, and this liquid was an ideal fluid. Now we can cut a very small part of this system to derive Bernoulli's equation. So let's look at a very tiny part of this entire system, and we'll model that section as our flow tube. So in other words, if I cut right there and right there, what I'm really left with is I'll, I'll enlarge this. So here it is. I just have this small section enlarged. So this flow tube right here is really just a small section of this larger flow over here. And I want to label some points. So here on the left, we have a cross-sectional area. I'll name this point 1. And then over here on the right, I have point 2. So here on the right, this is going to be A2, and then on the left, this is going to be A1. And if I were to draw a data, then I could just draw a general baseline down here, and I can say that this is zero, and then going up would be the y-axis. So at point one, we would have y1, and then at point two, we would have y2. And again, A, these A terms are just the cross-sectional areas that I've drawn here in red. And these Y values are just the distances from this datum up to those two points, so Y1 and Y2. Cool, so now I wanna draw the external forces because in this equation, we do have technically external forces doing work on this system, but where do those external forces come from? Well, if you remember, this segment is just this tiny segment from this big, large flow. So on the left side here, we still have fluid running through this pipe. And because there's fluid contained inside of the system, there's going to be pressures. And when you apply a pressure to some sort of cross-sectional area, 
you get force. Why? Because pressure is equal to force over area. And if you multiply both sides by A, so you get area times pressure is equal to force, we're going to get two different forces, one acting here to the right and one acting here to the left. So I'm going to label those two forces respectively F1 and F2. Two, and those are being applied at the center of those cross-sectional areas. Now F1 is acting to the right because we have all of this liquid here acting on the cross-section right here, so that is going to be acting to the right. But over here on the right side, this F2, well, there's liquid here. And the pressure from that liquid, the internal pressure from that liquid, is acting along this cross-sectional area. So that means the force has to be acting towards the cross-sectional area. Now you might be thinking, well, there's pressure inside of this liquid. Why don't we take into account those forces? Well, even though those pressures are internal, the forces are going to be internal. So again, we're not looking at internal forces here. We're only looking at external forces acting on the system. Because again, the conservation of energy equation is the total energy is equal to the work done by external forces, not internal. So these two forces right here are external to this system that we're studying, which is just a tiny section of this entire flow. Okay, cool. So we know that the fluid is flowing in this direction. So in a very brief amount of time, we know that at point one, the fluid has moved some distance. And I'm going to call that distance right here, delta R1. That's going to be a vector because direction is important. And over here on the right, we also had liquid that moved in this direction. And I'm going to call that delta R2. So again, because fluid is flowing, we know that at any two points inside of an ideal liquid, the volume of fluid here at point one equals the volume of fluid here at point two. Why? Because of the equation of continuity. Flow rates at point one and at point two are equal. So we know that the volume displaced here at point one and at point two are going to be the same. However, because this has a larger cross-sectional area than point one, this distance is going to be a little bit smaller. Now you'll notice at point one, the force is acting to the right and this displacement is also acting to the right. However, at point two, the displacement is acting to the right, but the force is acting to the left. So those directions are going to be very important in a later part in this video. Okay, cool. So I think a good place to start would be these external work. So let's try to figure out what this external work is. And external work is really the work of external forces done at point one plus the work done at point two. And if you remember, the general equation for work is force times distance. Right, that's what work is, force times distance. Okay, so let's try to calculate W1. So the work at point one. So that is going to be our force vector one dotted with our displacement vector R1. And what do we know about the dot product of two vectors? Well, that's just the magnitude of both values times the cosine of the angle between them. So force one is acting to the right and then the displacement is also acting to the right. So the angle between them is going to be zero. So again, that is the magnitude of F1 times the magnitude of this displacement vector times the cosine of the angle between them. So this turns out to be the magnitude of the F1 vector, which is just F1, times the magnitude of the displacement vector, which I'll actually call delta X1. So that is just the magnitude of this displacement vector. And I'll show you why I called it X1 instead of R1 a little bit later. But the cosine of the angle between them, well, that is just zero degrees and cosine of zero is one. So what we're really left with is just F1 times delta X1. Now I wanna rework this a little bit. What do we know about force? Well, earlier I said that pressure is equal to force over area. So if I rewrote this equation, and this is just off to the side, I get area times pressure is equal to force. So I can substitute this in for this F1 value. And what I'm going to be left with is the pressure at one times the cross-sectional area at one times delta X1. Now this is interesting. In this form, we have this area times a distance. And what is area times distance? Well, that's just volume. 
So this actually gets simplified even further to the pressure at one times the volume at one. And what is that volume? Well, it's the volume of the liquid displaced at point one, where this is delta x and this is the cross-sectional area. And I wrote these as deltas because these distances here at point one and point two are extremely small. We're just looking at a very brief snapshot of this flow. Okay, so if this is work at one, let's calculate work at two. Now, work at two is more or less going to be the same so I'm gonna write W2 is equal to the force displace or the force vector F2 dotted with delta R2. And this turns out to be, well, it's the magnitude of those two vectors times the angle between them. So the magnitude of F2 is just F2. And then for delta R2, that's just going to be, I'll say delta x2 and delta x2 again is just the magnitude of the displacement vector r2 times the cosine of the angle between them. Now this is interesting because if we look back at our diagram our displacement is acting to the right but our force vector is acting to the left so the angle between them is not zero as it was for w1 but it's actually going to be 180 degrees. So it's the cosine of 180. And what is the cosine of 180? That is negative one. So W2 is F2, or it's minus F2 times delta X2. And just like we did for W1, we could rework this F2 term to be minus P2 pressure times area times delta X2, right? Pressure times area gives us force. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit, and again, we can simplify this further because we have an area times a distance, and that gives us volume. So this is minus pressure two times V2, the volume. What is that volume? Well, that is this volume right here. So now that we have W2 and W1, we could calculate the external work, which is those two added together. So W external is going to be work one, which was P1 times V1, and then we're gonna to add to that work two, which was minus P2 times V2. Now what's interesting about this is that we know, because this is an ideal fluid, that these two volumes are the same. In other words, V1 is equal to V2. So I can rewrite this as pressure one minus pressure two, all times volume. Okay, cool. So now we have this external work term. So we have one of the three terms in this conservation of energy equation or this statement. Next, we need to calculate the change in kinetic energy and the change in potential energy. Potential energy is a little bit easier, which is this right here. So let's do that one first. So I'm gonna scroll down a little bit and we'll write gravitational potential energy. And remember, potential energy, U, is equal to mass times gravity times height. So that H is just a distance from the datum up to that point. Now our change in potential energy in this system right here is going to be MGH of 0.2 minus MGH of 0.1. So that's what we're gonna determine right here. This is equal to mg y2 minus mgy1, where y1 and y2 are these two distances right here. Okay, so this is our change in gravitational potential energy, and I need to rework this equation a little bit further. So if you remember from our earlier discussions, we had this rho term, which was our mass density, and that was equal to mass over volume, mass per unit volume. Now, if I rewrite this equation in terms of m, I would get m is equal to rho times v. All I did was just multiply both sides by v, and I get the equation in terms of m. So I can take this value right here and plug it in for these two m value terms in the gravitational potential energy equation. So let's go ahead and do that. That is equal to rho times v2 times gravity times y2 minus rho times v1 times gravity times y1. And again, v1 and v2 are equal, so I can further simplify this equation by pulling out all the constants, rho v times g, and I get y2 minus y1. Okay, awesome, so that is the delta u term for this system right here. So now we have both the external work and the gravitational potential energy term. All we're left with is this kinetic energy or the change in kinetic energy. So let's do that next. Let's apply this equation now. 
So I'll scroll down and just like we did for gravitational potential energy, I'll say kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So the change in kinetic energy for our system is going to be one half mass times velocity two squared minus one half mass times velocity one squared. And just like we did for our gravitational potential energy, our mass density rho is equal to mass over volume. And I can rewrite that as mass is equal to rho times volume. And so I can substitute this m for these two m's right there. So this is equal to one half m, which is rho times volume at two times the velocity at two squared minus one half rho times volume of one times velocity at one squared. And again, v2 and v1 are exactly the same volume. And so I can pull out all the constants in this equation, such as one half rho, volume and what I'm left with is v2 squared minus v1 squared. Awesome, so that is the change in kinetic energy of this system. So now we have all three terms. We have our external work term, we have our change in gravitational potential energy, and now our change in kinetic energy. So now I can combine all of those three terms with this equation and we should be able to derive Bernoulli's equation. So I'm just going to rewrite that down here. Okay, cool, so what is our delta K term? Well, it was that right there, so that's one half. Okay, so that is the change in kinetic energy. And then we need to add to it the change in potential energy. And that was this thingy right here, or more specifically, this. So I can rewrite that down here. Okay, awesome, this is our delta U term, and this is equal to our WEXT term, our external work. So that was this thingy right here. P1 times volume minus P2 times volume. And again, those volumes are exactly the same, so I'll go ahead and rewrite that down here. And this is our external work. Okay, cool, so you'll notice something pretty cool. In all of these terms, there is a volume. So we can cancel that volume term out for all of these terms on both sides of the equation. And then what we're left with is this thing right here. If I rewrite this equation with all the one terms on one side of the equation and all the point two terms on the other side of the equation, what I get is this, this right here, where on the left side we have pressure at point one plus one half times the mass density times the velocity at point one squared, plus the mass density times gravity times the height at point one, and that is equal to pressure at two, plus one half rho v two squared, and then rho times g times y two. And this right here is what we call Bernoulli's equation. And this is one of the most important equations in the field of fluid dynamics.